When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. It's not just a vintage car. It's the car you and your mom took to the beach every summer break. It's not just a wine cellar. It's years of memory stocked vineyard by vineyard. And that case full of autographed baseballs? A passion 30 years in the making. Cincinnati Insurance designed Cincinnati Private Client for the collections that tell a story. Because it's not only about insuring what you care for, it's about protecting what inspires you. The Cincinnati Insurance Company's everything insurance should be. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that studied at the Miyagi no Karate Dojo. He is the captain. I must look I Always look I. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Grinder Punch by the good people at Sound Growler Brewing Company in Tinley Park, Illinois. Garage grade, a solid four out of five bottle caps. Captain, it was brought to my attention that I have been had. Mm, Easy to do. Each week, very generous people go to truecrimegarage.com and they donate to the beer fund. And we are very, very thankful for that. And those funds, we do more than just purchase beer. Uh, The show has some overhead cost and we use... You know, if there's a little extra left over, we donate money to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Mm-hmm. So the beer fund is very near and dear to my heart because it shows the power of our garage group. And so each week we give a shout out, a sign of our gratitude for all of you out there. And we read off names and I do my best to read off the cities from all around the world. But a great listener out there has informed me that I was played because Someone had donated to our beer fund and left a name that is actually some kind of white supremacy code or reference or something that I was unaware of. Mm-hmm. So the, I'm, I want to address this because I was unaware that we were going to have to police the beer fund. And we will do that because I'm pretty upset about this, Captain, because mm-hmm. the garage is not just a talk show. We have always said that it is a community. It's a headspace, it's an escape, a place where all who are good, all who are kind, and all that don't litter are welcomed and can feel welcomed and know that they belong here. And antics like what we are talking about do not allow everyone to feel welcome or feel as though they belong. So we will not tolerate any of that crap here. So now the other part about it too, though, look, I don't care if someone gets on a blog or our Facebook page and says, Nick's an idiot, or I think your show is dumb. (laughs) You know, I don't like the cut of his jib because that comes with the territory. You know, we have a show, it's open to the public, and not everyone is going to like me or the captain or the show. And that's fine. But a lot of haters. But the, the, the big issue here for me personally is that when someone pulls a prank like this, something like this, this could severely damage or completely destroy relationships in my life, my family, and my friends. So mm-hmm. I wanted just to take a moment here, Captain, and apologize to everyone, everybody minus one person. Right, so donate to the beer fund, don't litter, and don't be a piece of shit. There you go. We will get back to the beer shout-outs tomorrow, and for now, thank you, and cheers to all of the True Crime Garage Army and the beautiful people of Parts Unknown. Now everyone gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, let's talk some true crime.
Police say a gunman shot and killed five women in a robbery at a women's clothing store late Saturday morning. The incident happened at this Lane Bryant southwest of Chicago. The store is at a strip mall called the Brookside Marketplace. Authorities say the store was open when the incident happened. When police arrived, they found the victims in the back of the store. The offender is described as a medium-skinned male black, five foot nine, 230 to 260 pounds. He was wearing a black waist-length winter coat, a black knit cap, and dark jeans. Authorities haven't identified the victims, but say they range in age from 22 to 37. They say four were from suburban Chicago and one was from South Bend, Indiana. One resident says crime is a growing problem in the area and security needs to be beefed up. And this could have been us. And I just feel really sorry for the people's family and the victims because, you know, it, this could have been, this could have been prevented. Police brought in a helicopter and dogs to search for the gunman, but found no sign of him. There was no security camera inside the Lane Bryant store, but police say they're trying to determine if the suspect was recorded by any cameras at neighboring stores. Our true crime story this week is from a lovely place called Tinley Park. Tinley Park is a village located in Cook County, Illinois. It is one of the fastest growing suburbs south of Chicago. This horrific crime took place in 2008, but to give you a general idea of the location, Tinley Park, Illinois, in 2007 had no murders mm -hmm. and only 15 robberies were reported in this village. The population was just over 56,000 at the 2010 census. And in 2009, Tinley Park was selected by Business Week, a uh, very good magazine, as the best place to raise a family in America. So the single best place in all of America, Captain. Oh, that sounds pretty lovely. In 2017, Tinley Park was listed as one of the 50 safest cities in America. Did so you know that um, the garage was voted number one place to do a podcast? In the world. And Parts Unknown was number two mm -hmm. desired place to live for the very low taxes. That <laughs> pay the, that's almost, we, we pay you to live there. Yeah. So while I feel very good about those assessments being quite accurate, you know, that this is a safe place, mm -hmm. great place to raise a family, this crime may make you feel different, but it is crimes like this that remind all of us that unfortunately these sort of things are while they can be rare, they can happen anywhere. Anywhere. Lane Bryant is at the center of this case. Um, and it's going to be a Lane Bryant store in Tinley Park. Mm -hmm. Lane Bryant is a store for the ladies. Uh, according to their website, Lane Bryant is the most recognized name in plus size clothing. And their emphasis is on fashion and fit, not merely size. Well, I just want to point out the fact that in the Lululemon case, they didn't sell to plus size. And now Lane Bryant, they're known for plus sizes. I don't think they sell to the petite ladies. There's the, a lot of discrimination going on in, in selling <laughs> both clothes. Both ways. Um, but they, Lane Bryant will tell you that their emphasis on fashion and fit is what makes them a style leader. So a uh, quick and interesting story history here for uh, Lane Bryant. The company was founded way back in 1904 by Lena Bryant. Uh, she made maternity clothing, mainly dresses, I think. Mm -hmm. Lena rented a storefront on Fifth Avenue. The name Lane Bryant, well, the company got that name because a bank officer misspelled Lena's name on the paperwork. Hmm. The business opened its first branch store in Chicago in 1915. So Lane Bryant has been deep rooted in the Chicago area for a long time. As of 2013, the chain consisted of 812 stores in 46 U.S. states, only Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, and Wyoming at that time did not have Lane Bryant stores. In 2010, Lane Bryant accused Fox and ABC of censoring their 30-second ad spot during commercial breaks for the Dancing with the Stars in American Idol TV shows. Mm -hmm. The ads featured plus-size model Ashley Graham in their line of lingerie. 
Lane Bryant accused the networks of discrimination because stating that the networks had no problem airing Victoria's secret advertisements with similar similarly clad models right. in the same time slots. I'm a lover of all women of all sizes. Just putting that out there. Hey, I'm a lover of Ashley Graham. <laughs> um, so, all right. Lane Bryant store, this particular Lane Bryant store that we are discussing today is located in the great village of Tinley park mm-hmm. at the Brookside marketplace, which was built in 2005. Lane Bryant, there were, there were probably what about six or seven Lane Bryant stores in the greater Columbus area around us somewhere. I don't know. I never go shopping, but it's pretty much like a big box store, right? Yeah. So smaller than a target, but still a decent size store. Yeah. You normally find them in a mall or a strip mall. So this particular one is a 23,000 square foot store. Now, back in 2008, Brookside Marketplace included some storefronts that were not open yet, this making the Lane Bryant store more isolated. Mm. The strip mall skirts a major section of Interstate 80, uh, the Belt of America, and it also has a Holiday Inn and a Sleep Inn nearby, so hotels nearby. Hotel, motel, holiday inn. No houses are in immediate in the immediate area, and a few apartment buildings are about a half a mile away. Okay. So this brings us, Captain, to Saturday, February 2nd, 2008, which was a very cold day. The ground was frozen and snow covered. Yeah, it was actually the day before the Super Bowl. Yes, it was, Captain. We have uh, 42-year-old Rhoda McFarland. She went to work on this Saturday, but she was not scheduled to work. Uh, She was the store manager at the Lane Bryant store. Now, she knew that her employees would be stretched on that Saturday after the corporate office mailed customers flyers promoting a big $9.99 clearance sale. Now, I don't know much about the Lane Bryant store, but from what I understand, it's some of the items can be more expensive. Mm-hmm. And so this is a pretty good deal for everybody. This will draw in the customers on a on a busy Saturday. Everybody's going to line up to get some good deals. Did you say nine ninety nine? That's right. So rather than she's a she's a team player. Uh, this store manager Rhoda. She rather than force her staff to go it alone, she decides to pitch in and go in that day. Mm-hmm. Now the Lane Bryant store opened its doors for business at ten a.m. The crime began to unfold shortly after. At 10.08, a man entered the store and engaged the clerk, asking her questions about a delivery. He carried with him some type of papers that he stated were related to the delivery that he was attempting to make at this store. Mm. Now, this man was wearing a dark-colored, below-the-waist-length winter coat. As he entered the Lane Bryant store... It is reported that he looked toward the ceiling, and this is believed that he was looking for cameras. He chatted briefly with Rhoda McFarlane, the store manager. He also talked to another person that we will refer to as the witness. Uh, We don't use her real name. We don't know her real name, but she is called Martha. And we're not using her name because the police don't use her name. Right. She's only referred to as Martha, so that's what we, we will have to call her here. So the man spoke to both of these ladies regarding this delivery. Well, this, this was a ruse. Um, he was not there to make some kind of delivery. This was used to engage somebody with inside the store. I'm a little confused why he would use this as some kind of tactic, but we're going to see where it goes from there. Okay. So Rhoda, the manager, she decides to try to help out. So she calls another store location to see if there was some kind of mix up with the delivery because she's telling the guy, we don't have any delivery scheduled. Right. So maybe this delivery was supposed to go to another store. Anyway, during this time, two customers entered the store. It is at this time, the police would later say that the man then pulled out a gun and announced a holdup. He forced the four women into the back room. This was a small employee ba- break room. He forced the women to tape each other's hands, and then he bound the remaining women uh, or woman himself. After binding them, he told them to lay face down on the floor. Then two more women 
who who later entered the store, they were also taken to the back room. They were bound and placed next to the others. Now, the order, so we have four customers at this time. Right. Everybody's been taken hostage. The order of which the customers came in is unknown. It is known that Connie Woolfork uh, was a fighter. And at some point during this holdup, she had a physical altercation with the suspect. She was struck in the face with what is believed to have been the butt of the gun that the man had brought with him. She also had blood under her fingernails, which is believed to have come from the suspect. So she fought this guy at some point. Right. This man also took some of the store's clothing and placed it over the heads of some of the women. Now, I want to be clear here on this statement because I've this has been reported multiple ways from multiple sources. Hmm. And several of the sources suggest that all of the women had their heads covered with, with clothing items. Some suggest that it was just a few of the women. Um, and also... One report, a couple reports state that women's panties were used to cover their heads. Now, while this might not seem important, I think that it is somewhat important because we're going to be relying on some witness statements to have conclusions and thoughts about this suspect. And we will have to use our own opinions to determine how much weight to apply to those witness statements later. Mm. So... Apparently one of the victims, um, one of the ladies that was bound was the, was a target of sexual advances by the suspect during the time that he had them taken hostage. It is stated that she was fondled. There was, that's not not sexual advances. That's, that's assault, right? Sexual assault. I, I I apologize. I'm reporting it as it, as it was. Whoever reported it is a tool bag. Um, there, there were no further sexual content, or contact from suspect to any of the other victims beyond that point. Now, store manager Rhoda McFarland, somehow she managed to call 911. She had her uh, cell phone Bluetooth. Yeah. She calls 911 at 1044 AM. And I want everybody to kind of mark that time in their, in their heads here, because remember we're saying that the man entered the store at approximately 10 08. So he's been in the store for quite some time. All right. 10.08, he enters at 10.44, there's a 911 call. And he's still in the store at this time. Now, Rhoda, she managed to to make this call while the gunman was distracted, mm-hmm. uh, even though she was bound with tape. On the call, which is posted on the Tinley Park Police website, um, so very, very brave Rhoda McFarland calls to notify 911 of the robbery in progress. The The 911 dispatcher picks up, and at this point, Rhoda says, Lane Bryant. She whispers it yeah, to the uh, yeah. dispatcher. And the dispatcher asks, where at? And she states, Tinley Park, please hurry. Well, let's take a listen to that 911 call. 911 emergency. Lane Bryant. You know, where at? Stay on the line. Stay on the line. Let me get you to Tinley Park. Don't hang up. It is believed that the suspect heard the dispatcher's voice over Rhoda McFarland's Bluetooth. The police were dispatched. A Tinley Park police officer was in an adjacent parking lot at the time of the 911 call. It is approximated that he was about 20, I'm sorry, 200 yards away. Mm-hmm. So police arrived on the scene very quickly, and it is reported that the first officer arrived only about two minutes after the short 911 call. Now, the the witness that we are calling Martha, she has stated that she believes she heard police sirens before the shooting started. So this is at approximately 1046 a.m. So all six women at this point at 1046 a.m. were shot execution style. Rhoda McFarlane was the only one shot in the forehead, the rest in the back of their heads. The man then walked out the front door and disappeared. Five of the ladies were dead when police arrived. And as we said, only a couple minutes from the beginning of McFarlane's 911 call. Mm -hmm. One woman survived. This is who we are are calling Martha. She too had been shot and left for dead, but she tricked the killer by moving her head at the last second, causing a severe 
graze in her neck. She then pretended to be dead until police arrived. A black SUV as well as a black sedan were seen on video leaving the Lane Bryant parking lot at approximately 1048 a.m. So all of this happened within a time span of about 40 minutes. The suspect arrives at the Lane Bryant store at approximately 10.08. Mm -hmm. The call to 911 is placed at 10.44. Shots are fired at approximately 10.46, and the suspect left the scene at approximately 10.48. Pandora makes it easy for you to find your favorite music. Discover new artists and genres by selecting any song or album, and we'll make you a personalized station for free. Download on the Apple App Store or Google Play and enjoy the soundtrack to your life. If you're a parent, you want to be doing everything you can to set your child up for success in life. So make sure to check out IXL. IXL is an online learning program for kids. Use it on your computer, phone, or tablet. IXL covers math, language arts, science, and social studies through interactive practice problems from pre-K to 12th grade. IXL even has skill plans for specific textbooks. As kids practice, they get positive feedback, awards, and clear explanations when they get questions wrong. Plus, as your kid uses it, the IXL program figures out what your kids need more help with and adapts. You'll save so much time. One subscription gets you everything. All subjects, all grade levels, one site. You'll save so much money, too. Memberships start at only $9.95 a month. IXL is something that all the parents are leaning on these days. The kids take a break for summer. You don't want them forgetting everything that they learned last year and starting off slow this year. No. My friends tell me their kids are loving the IXL experience, and the parents are very happy with IXL as well. It's something you will want to check out. With the school year ramping up, now is the best time to get IXL. Our listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash truecrimegarage. Visit IXL.com slash truecrimegarage to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we're faced with a crossroads in life, and we don't know which path to take. Maybe you're thinking about a career change or feeling like your relationship needs some TLC. Whatever it is, therapy can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find the way forward. Throughout times in my life, I've felt that therapy is right for me. And while I was a little apprehensive at first, each and every time I have found therapy to be an enlightening and positive experience. If you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash garage. If you've been wanting to learn a new language because you have an upcoming international trip, Rosetta Stone, the most trusted language learning program is for you. Zeta Stone is available on desktop and can also be used as an app on your phone or tablet. Rosetta Stone teaches through immersion. Learn by matching audio from native speakers to visuals, reading stories, participating in dialogues, and more practical language skills. Choose from 25 languages, including Spanish, French, Dutch, and Arabic. It's used by millions and has been around for 30 years because it works. With Rosetta Stone's true accent feature on how well you are pronunciating words. Plus, find lessons as short as 10 minutes that can be done anytime. That's why I love Rosetta Stone. I can study anywhere at any time. 
Whether you're learning Rosetta Stone at home on your desktop or on the go on the Rosetta Stone app, you can learn from 25 different languages anytime, anywhere. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, True Crime Garage listeners get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 40% off. That's $179 for unlimited access for 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 40% off at rosettastone.com slash garage today. rosettastone.com slash garage. All right, we're back. Newspapers went to the doorsteps and newsstands the following morning. The Sunday Chicago Tribune led with the headline, Five Women Slain in Store, Police Hunt Gunman and Shooting at Tinley Park Mall. The article reads, A gunman led women into the back of a clothing store Saturday morning, killed them, then walked out the front door and disappeared. Police said there were no survivors at the Lane Bryant store in a suburban strip mall along Interstate Highway 80 in what they are calling a botched robbery. Still, with little information made public, conflicting reports and rumors about motives and witnesses swirled throughout the day. Officers from at least eight local departments quickly descended on the shopping center. Some went from door to door combing stores for clues. Others hunted in a nearby subdivision for a stocky man described by one witness while helicopters hovered in the sky. One helicopter armed with an infrared camera scanned snow-covered open land and forest preserves. Police pleaded for help from anyone with information on the killing spree. As night fell, the gunman remained on the loose. Tinley Park Police Chief Michael O'Connell tried to calm fear, saying, We are very confident that the offender is out of the area. But earlier in the day, an officer at the scene admitted, We have no idea who he is. The gunman was still at large late Saturday. Do they have any evidence of what he took or did he take anything? Let's get into that, but I want to kind of clarify some things. I found that that article to be very interesting. This is what the the locals are hearing. These are the reports they're hearing and reading Mm -hmm. just the day after. And I thought we should comb through that because there's one very important detail here. And that is that the the police are stating that there were no survivors, mm-hmm. that five women were taken hostage. They were all shot and killed before the man left the store. The reason for this, this is not any confusion on anyone's part. Mm-hmm. This is simply to protect the living witness. They did not want the offender to be aware that there was a survivor. Right. They didn't want this person to know that there is still a person alive from the scene that could identify them and that he might, I mean, we have to keep this in mind, whether he went into the store with intending to kill anyone at all, we don't know. Right. But at the end of the day, what he did do, what this person did do is murder five people, very capable of looking for this woman, finding her and killing her. We wouldn't even know at this point in the investigation, if he would have known who she was. Yeah. I mean, there could be ties from the suspect to one or more of the victims, or I mean, is is she being kept in a hospital for observation for days on end? You know, we've, we've all seen the, the mob movies where there's somebody that survives something and they're a living witness Mm -hmm. and they got to put the police officers by their door because we could get some mobster dude come in in the middle of the night and take this person out. But on the other side of things, you could say there was a survivor, and if this was just a robbery that went bad and this person snapped, that could force the hand of this individual to turn himself in. Mm. Like, oh, somebody survived? I'm going to get caught. Let me turn myself in. Well, let's take a look real quick, Captain, at the key players in this whole crime. Let's talk about some. Let's talk about the victims as well as what they may know about the suspect. So there were five women killed, one wounded. Uh, She was treated that, you know, the wounded one would go on to be known as Martha. She would be treated at St. James Hospital in Olympia Fields, and she was released on Sunday. So she was in the hospital for approximately 24 hours. Right. 
Uh, currently, it's my understanding that this living witness uh, is living out of the area now, um, but she stays in close phone contact with police investigators, and she's been extremely cooperative, and she is there for them whenever they need to ask questions of her. So one of the victims that we've already mentioned by name was Rhoda McFarlane, mm-hmm. age 42. She was the manager of the Lane Bryant store in Tinley Park. She had been there for two years. She was a U.S. Air Force veteran. Uh, She worked as a nurse at Andrews Air Force Base. Rhoda served as an associate pastor at Embassy Christian Center. She began working at Lane Bryant after her Crest Hill Church had closed. She started a program at her church called Princess. This program teaches girls proper etiquette and guides them to help them grow to be young, productive women. She was planning on expanding this program and expanding it to other churches um, in in the area as well, in other areas as well. Right. She went to work that Saturday, but but was not scheduled to work, as we had already said. Now, Rhoda was engaged over the holidays of 2007 to a man named Stuart Gibbs. She continued to answer her Christian calling at the Lane Bryant store, often, often using her employee discount to buy clothes for people who are less fortunate. She is the only victim that was shot in the forehead. This is believed that the killer caught her on the phone talking to 911. And when he confronted her, that's when he shot her in the forehead. And another one of the victims is Jenny Lynn Bishop. Yeah, Jenny was 34 at the time of this crime. She was from South Bend, and she was a customer at the Lane Bryant. She was married to Brian Bishop, and they had three young children. She graduated from Indiana University with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1996. She had been employed by Memorial Hospital since 1995. She worked in the intensive care unit. Fellow nurses described her as a compassionate, caring, knowledgeable, and efficient worker. Well, she's a nurse, so you know she was a badass. Relatives of Jenny Bishop believe that she may have gone to the Lynn Bryant store that day to cash in a birthday gift card. Yeah, the Lane Bryant. Yeah, she had celebrated her 34th birthday just five days prior to the crime. Her husband was in the area for business, and she was out while he was working. Our next victim is Sarah Zafransky. She's 22 years old at the time of the crime from Oak Forest. She was a customer as well. The future looked promising for Sarah because in May of 2007, she had graduated from Northern Illinois University with a degree in finance and had a job already lined up at CNA Financial Corp. And this is in Chicago. She went to the Lane Bryant store that day because she needed work clothes for her first post-college job. Right Now, later after life, a, a park bench and Oak Force bears her name. She was the youngest of the five murdered victims, just 22 years old. Now, scholarships were also awarded in her name. Connie Woolfork uh, was one that we had mentioned by name as well. She was 37 at the time of Flossmore. She was a customer as well at the store that day. She was a single mother of two sons, ages 16 and 10. Her youngest child suffers from spina bifida, and requires much of his mother's time and attention. For seven years, she served the village of Park Forest in a variety of positions, working in the finance and community development departments. She left her job with the village in December of 2006, this to pursue a family mortgage business with her mother. Connie worked as a mortgage lender, lived with her mother and two sons. To help make ends meet in the troubled housing market, she took a second job stocking shelves overnight at the Super Target in the same Tinley Park shopping center. She was treating herself to a manicure and pedicure on that Saturday and some shopping at Lane Bryant to buy a new outfit. When she didn't show up for a scheduled meeting with a client at 2 p.m., her family grew increasingly worried. Her family said that she was a fighter and would not have gone along without a fight. It is reported that she had bruising and blood under her fingernails that might have been from the suspect. Mm -hmm. The bruising, as we said, is thought to be from being struck 
in the head with the gun. We also have Carrie Chiusu. She's 33 years old of Frankfurt. She was a customer. Carrie was a social worker at her school, um, Homewood Flossmore High School. That, my friends, social worker at a high school, is an extremely tough and difficult job. I don't know this particular high school, but I know two ladies that work in these very same capacities. Mm. And let me tell you, friends, that is no walk in the park. Now, Carrie and her husband married a year and a half before the murders. Her husband was waiting for her to return home from a quick shopping trip to the Lane Bryant clothing store when he saw the news reports on TV. And he actually recognized her car parked in front of the store on the news coverage. You want to talk about a sick feeling? Yeah. After Tony saw his wife's car in the news reports, he left their home and he went to the Tinley Park police station. There he was, what he was suspecting was confirmed yeah. that she was one of the victims. Now, the day after Carrie died, her brother's wife went into labor. Uh, they had a little girl who they named, they named her Carrie. Mm. Uh, Carrie's current and former students packed into the, what ended up being a seven hour wake for Carrie in, in memorial of her life. Martha, as we said, not her real name. She was the surviving victim. She was 30, she was 33 years old at the time, a part-time employee at the Lane Bryant store. She was shot along with the rest, but the bullet went into her neck, missing vital organs. She was enrolled in nursing school and working two jobs to make ends meet. Recently divorced, she stated that she had heard the police sirens prior to the shooting started. So what do we know about the suspect? Well, the killer was not wearing a mask or disguise. He was described as six foot tall. And I do want to kind of add to that though a little bit because I've read and watched news reports yeah. that will state that he could have been as short as I believe five nine. Yeah. Um which or, is pretty short for a male. Or he could have been as tall as six two. Now I want to throw this in there though. The overwhelming majority of these stories say that the man was six foot tall, that he was approximately six foot tall. Yeah, but don't they also say he was stocky? Yeah, so he, it's an he's an African-American male of average weight. Um, he The police have described him as stocky, but also average weight. See, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, they state that they believe he's between two and 220 pounds. All right, but at six foot tall, I wouldn't call somebody stocky. He's also described as a medium to dark skin tone with braided hair with three to five poofy cornrows pulled toward the back of his head. One braid hung down the right cheek and had four light green beads on the end. Mm. This man is believed to have been between the ages of 25 and 35 years old at the time of the murders. Now, the suspect, this is where we might have a little issue with his weight, Captain. The suspect was wearing a dark-colored waist-length jacket or coat. Right. Now, we did say it was very cold that day. The ground was frozen, snow-covered. Depending on the, the, the poofiness or the bulk of this coat, that could change the perception of his weight. Yeah, my jacket makes me look a little fluffy. There are some reports out there that state that he was seen having a roll of duct tape in one of the pockets of this coat. Mm -hmm. The suspect was also wearing black jeans with an embroidery on the back pocket, similar to a cursive G. Now, one possibility here, Captain, is that he was wearing G-Unit clothing. The G-Unit clothing company was established in 2003. This is because of 50 Cent, and you know he teamed up with Mark Echo mm -hmm. to create this line of clothing and accessories inspired by 50 Cent and fellow G unit members. These jeans have a cursive G on the pocket. Right. So possibly wearing this line of clothing. Now the suspect was also wearing a charcoal gray or dark ski skull cap on his head. A couple of websites mentioned that he had possibly left behind a baseball hat at the scene of the crime. The survivor said the killer may have had professionally manicured fingernails. 
This is only mentioned once. So, mm. you know, I, I, I actually hesitated to even put this in the report, but on airing on the side of full disclosure, throw it in there and, and right, let right. people make what they want of it. Now, police have released a composite sketch based on the witness's description. The weapon that he used is a Smith and Wesson Glock. The gunman took a few hundred dollars, according to police. There were two vehicles seen leaving the area shortly after the shooting. This was a black SUV Mm -hmm. and a black sedan. Now, police have said that they have fingernail clippings. Remember, we said that one of the victims had, it's believed that she had blood underneath her fingernails. Remember, we also stated that the man came in with papers that are supposed to be part of this delivery uh, that he was making, Uh, maybe instructions or some type of invoice, something like that. Uh, It's believed that the police have these papers that he left them at the scene of the crime. So possibly touch DNA on those. Correct. Correct. So that's what we know for certain on the suspect. Do you think this is just a robbery turned murder? Well, that seems to be the strongest theory or motive that's out there because Mm -hmm. this is a very strange crime, Captain, when you, when you really think of the simplicity of it, where you have so many people being killed, so many murdered victims, and yet you have almost a robbery situation that doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it. And I know that there are probably details of this crime that have just not been made public Right. And therefore, we are only working with part of the story. But yes, I would say that probably the strongest or most popular theory regarding this crime out there is that the thought is it was a simple robbery that turned violent. Um, so a botched robbery in which the offender made off with very little cash. In right. the course of the robbery, he figures out that one of the ladies had called 911 and he panics and shoots all of them. Yeah, within a couple minutes. Yeah. So, and, and what, I mean, I understand that this is the most likely theory, but you're robbing a store at the beginning of the work day. The store opens at 10 o'clock. You enter the store at 8 o, or 10 o 8, sorry. You know, you're out of the store within 45 minutes. You take a couple hundred dollars. I mean, you're going to rob a store where most people understand that there's a night drop done for all these stores. And a lot of these stores, especially like Elaine Bryant, these are credit card based stores. And and now most stores don't carry a lot of cash on them. So so you see what I'm saying? Like, no, no, no. I I follow you. And that's why I feel like this is a crime that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And, 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 and here's where I go with that. My thought is that I, what I can see from what we know from the living witnesses statements right. is that we are probably working and talking about a very unorganized offender here. And I see where this guy may have had some type of plan, whether, whether it all makes sense to us may not be the case. Right. We don't know what kind of rhyme or reason this dude's working with first of all. And then second of all, it appears to me like he lost control of the situation fairly quickly. And when things weren't going his way, he's not intelligent enough to work through the problem, to problem solve on the spot. In the end, his only result, the only thing he can come up with is to kill everybody and leave. Yeah. Um, so, so let's, let's go through this first theory here. Okay? okay. Cause you bring up some good points. So if this was to be a robbery why would somebody choose a store like Lane Bryant or any kind of clothing store at all to rob early on a Saturday? Right. So I, my first thought there would be that we have a guy that is looking for what he would perceive to be a soft target, an easy target. Yeah, chances are the employees are going to be female. Chances are the customers are going to be female. And by choosing early morning hours, you may have less people in the store to have to deal with. Yeah. Because we, as we mentioned, this is a 23,000 square foot store. It could be tough. It could be tough to corral everybody and manage the scene just given the space of this place. I mean, people can hide fairly easily in a 23,000 square foot building. But that also might be to your point that the suspect is not 
thinking things clearly. And so he's going to rob a place that one is not going to have a lot of cash on it. And it's a big building. Mm -hmm. Now, when we say that a soft target, that, that uh, potential victims or people being in the store would all be female or most likely to be female. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear here. We're using, we're trying to use the criminals thought process here, trying to use the suspects thought process here. And we don't know that for certainty, but the guess would be that that may have put some kind of put him at ease in some way that there was a reason for picking this particular store. That is really the only thing that stands out to me or is, could it be that this man believes that, okay, they're, they're not selling low line stuff, right? You know, maybe there's some more money in this store than would be in some of the other stores because they're, you know, more expensive items. Right. So a soft target too should be secluded in some way, um, from, from busy areas. And we know the Lane Bryant store was away from the rest of the businesses and it's in a strip mall that was not fully rented out at the time. Yeah. Also an easy target should have an easy escape route. The Lane Bryant is just minutes from interstate 80. This is a huge uh, freeway that, that starts in New Jersey and ends in California. We had mentioned that the timing is a little weird, um, but for the sake of wanting an easy target, the timing is great. So he walks into the store that just opened its doors eight minutes prior, less likely to encounter a large number of customers. But if it's the money that you're after, why not pick a bank or a gas station, right? Yeah. Well, we have the, the surviving witnesses account. The killer, according to her, the killer walked in and was looking up at the ceiling and it's believed he was possibly looking for cameras. Now, my thought here is that this man knows that banks and gas stations, because of their high probability of getting robbed, will be outfitted with cameras. Yeah, multiple cameras. So when he went into the store, he has he's technically committed zero infractions against the law at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So if he walks in and he's never been in this store before and he's looking up and he sees cameras, he can simply just turn around and walk out and go pick another target at this well, time. Well, he, he is wearing G-unit pants, so I think that is a crime. <laughs> um, there's There are some drawbacks to this theory, and you've mentioned a couple of them, Captain, but I kind of want to go through my laundry list here so we don't leave any out. As long as it doesn't include any G-unit pants, I'm okay with your laundry list. So as you mentioned, how much money would there be in a register that that's, you know, they just opened up the store eight minutes prior? Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, here's the other thing too. In a couple of accounts, they state that the guy may have robbed the women too. Uh -huh. So most of the material out there does not state this, but this could, this could be possible. Maybe even likely, you know, he had the ladies bound and if he fell in control of the situation, he gets the cash from the register and from the office and finds out it's not that much money. He yeah. decides to rob the ladies as well. I mean, Might it's, as well. Yes, it's 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 reminiscent of that conversation in the diner scene in Pulp Fiction when the couple is getting ready to rob the diner and they're talking about what their plan is and their last heist, mm -hmm. and they say that they both agree that it was a good idea that they robbed both the business and the customers in the last heist because they they doubled their take. Yeah, but. Again, not very well thought out because how many people are carrying cash? Well, I, I'm just stating this could be a possibility after he finds out he's not got right, much right, money right, right. at this point. I agree. So, and, and keep in mind, the killer was in the store for approximately 40 minutes. This gives him enough time to rob the ladies as well. Now, I do wonder here, one thing that I... One thing that I wish that we had here is a lot more information. I think there was probably a lot of stuff that went down in that store over the course of the 40 minutes. Yeah. What At what time did he draw his gun is a big question for me. I would love to know what time the store manager called the other store to inquire about the delivery that he was pretending to do. Mm -hmm. So let's say that this theory is right, that this is correct. This would lead me to believe, and I'm sure that the police have looked into this, and I, if not, I don't understand them why they wouldn't have. But um, <laughs> Then we need to get new police officers. Yeah. 
my thought would be just food for thought here, Captain. Uh-huh. Potentially, this guy might have some experience in doing this. And what I mean by this is maybe the plan doesn't seem so bad when you work it over the course of many different stores. I mean, it only didn't work out in this situation is what I'm getting at. Because here's the thought. The suspect may have hit what he perceives to be soft targets before, and he's hitting them early in the morning for a good reason. Maybe he's only looking to get a few hundred dollars, let's say $200, whatever's in the register. Right. Now, why would he do this? The thought is that he would bring, he brings a gun into the store with him, mm-hmm. but probably most of the time he never even needs to draw the weapon. To make the threat, he just Mm -hmm. goes up, threatens the person at the register or speaks to somebody in the store, tells them it's going to be a robbery and he makes off with $200. Now, keep in mind, if he doesn't pull a gun, a $200 unarmed robbery will go away pretty fast in most police jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you did this at the bank, it's a federal offense. Second of all, if you if you mention that there's a gun. Mm hmm then it's armed robbery, so it doesn't matter if you show your gun or not. Right, an implied it. threat of a firearm is the same as having right, a firearm. Right, but chances are that these registers are not going to have bait money or die packs. That's what a bank would have. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the die packs are normally within like a football field or so. They just blow up mm-hmm. and they turn everything blue. They smurf your ass. <laughs> um, so, yes, I agree that this plan doesn't seem so dumb except for the fact that you're going into a store showing your face and yes less likely that there's going to be there's going to be less cameras than a bank but Mm -hmm. there's still going to be cameras but now you have all these eyewitnesses that see your face so I still think it's a really horrible plan but I, I think that he manages to get out of the store and there are no cameras to take footage of him well, we have cameras seeing cars leave. Right. Those are from another store. Right. So, all right, let's get into, let's go to theory two real quick. All right. All this right. is a very similar theory in the sense that it's robbery, but possibly an inside job, meaning our offender, the killer had inside help, maybe an assistant manager or former manager or, or s- former employee. Correct. Right. So I'll break this down real quick. Inside job, meaning that this robbery was set up with the help of a current employee or former employee of this particular Lane Bryant store, or maybe even another Lane Bryant store. These would be the only, so one thing that I'm curious about here with the money, we know that a few, I'll call you whiskers, a few hundred dollars was taken in this robbery. I would love to know, did this come from the safe? Did it come from the register? Did it come from a combination of both Mm -hmm. also robbing the, the, uh, customers as well. Where did this money come from? Because one thing here is that current managers, current assistant managers, or previous managers and assistant managers are likely to be the only people with the safe combination. Mm -hmm. So if money was taken from the safe, he accessed that safe in some form or fashion, whether it be through the employees that were at the Lane Bryant that day, or he walked in there with prior knowledge of this store. Right now, where I worked before, there was a safe, but all it had was the two drawers that we used. So there was no extra funds. It was just whatever's in those drawers. Mm -hmm. So, again, even if you just got the one drawer and then you open up the safe so I can get the next drawer, I would, one, assume that he would get more than a few hundred dollars if he could get to both drawers. So, again, that would be information that... I don't know if it would help the investigation, but again, I mean, this crime is now 10 years old. I think at some point, try to get the public involved. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're covering the case to shine some light on it and get people talking about this. So if this, in fact, were the correct theory here, uh, the correct motive, let this is kind of how I see it, it playing out, okay? So the inside person, the accomplice that this man had, that this killer had failed to show up to the store for whatever reason that day, you know, the inside accomplice got cold feet or whatever, decided not to show this leaving the suspect stuck with six women 
who he thought could identify him. He walks in there without any type of disguise. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't, he doesn't discover that his helper, that his accomplice is not there until after he's drawn the gun and already told everybody that there's going to be a holdup. So as the suspect is, is waiting, he had to control the workers and the customers. And as time went on at the scene, he starts to lose control of the scene. Mm-hmm. And once he hears the 911 operator on McFarland's phone, he knew that the robbery was a total bust except for the register money. And then the suspect hears the sirens in the distance and in a moment of anger or panic or both, he killed the women and fled the scene. Mm-hmm. I I think this could be a strong theory. The only reason why I I really question the weight of this theory is like what you for what you just said. 10 years has passed. Okay. And this theory is easily investigated. And we know from detectives that we know here in Columbus and in the greater Columbus area, that this is often the theory that they look at first when they start looking into these crimes. Can we tie anybody that's working there or previous employees to this criminal act, whether it Mm -hmm. just be the theft robbery or what went down here? So in exploring this possibility, Here's some more information, and this is what I was able to gather from an assistant manager of a Lane Bryant store, and it it is stating, this person told me that it is store policy. It was then and is currently store policy to have a manager or an assistant manager open the store along with a regular employee. Right, which we kind of learned from the Lululemon case. It is also policy to drop off the previous day's proceeds at the bank in the morning before the store opened. So this has been one thing that's highly contested. So all I can go off of is what this person told me. I've never worked a day in my life at Lane Bryant. I haven't worked a day in your life. I filled out two applications. They didn't even call me for an interview or anything. For Lane Bryant? Yeah. Oh. I'm I'm, I'm joking. Oh, I was going to say it's because you have a fascination with their spokes models. So... Just to be clear on that, Mm -hmm. all the money taken in the day before is then counted the next morning and dropped off at the bank before they open for business on that day. Mm. Pretty clear? Yeah. So if you get there early enough, you get the drop. According to this person, the assistant manager and the manager are the only two that had the safe combination. So if, like you said, if this person could have got to the store before they opened their doors, yeah. there's a chance at that time the safe would have been open. Money is out and being counted by each employee. Um, and during this time, once the money's counted, they sign off on it. And he- here's my thought. Any chance this guy didn't do much homework and thought the store was opening at 11? Because that's where that's where you start to wonder about the delivery. He seems to have a ruse to want to get in the store. Now, you don't need a ruse to get into the store and assess the situation when the doors are open. Anybody can just walk you in You just there. go in and act like you're shopping. Yeah. Yeah, but this guy had uh, what he, a fake delivery that he was planning on doing. Yeah, but I think to me, the the fake delivery is more of a setup to for him to get into the building Mm-hmm. And for him to be looking around and to kind of case casing the joint with this ruse. And also, I think with this insider job idea, right, mm-hmm. that it's an insider job. I also think that there's a lot of there's high turnover rate in these retail stores. And you're talking about normally a lot of different ages. You know, when I worked at PacSun, there was a lot of people uh, in their late teens, early 20s. And then you had other people in their mid thirties. So you got this pretty decent range and it could have just been somebody drinking at a party saying, well, I used to work there and blah, blah, blah. You see what I'm saying? Right. I get you. And and telling about the workings of, of the store, right? You, or this guy dated some girl that worked at Lane Bryant two years ago. I mean, he could have some kind of insider knowledge on some different level. Well, where the, this is where I have a big issue with this whole story. Mm-hmm. is that we have, if if he in fact had insider knowledge of the intricate workings of the Lane Bryant store, 
or if he was working with an accomplice. Remember, we were stating that according to this person that we spoke to, that the money is counted in the morning and then taken to the bank that day. And this is done by a, an assistant manager or a manager. And the store is opened by a manager or assistant manager and another employee. Right. The, the thing that I have a big question mark on here is, and that makes this whole thing very curious to me, is that Rhoda McFarlane, the store manager, she was not, it's general knowledge that she was not scheduled to work that day. And according to newspaper accounts, she was ends up being the only manager that we can get the name of of being in the store that day. Right. So what could have happened, though, is that a manager gets sick, assistant manager, somebody gets sick, something happens, they have to call off work, and she had to come in. Of course. But no, I, I understand how that works. I'm saying what makes it weird is that either that's just a coincidence or... It, this happened on this day for a reason. Right. And so the questions, here are some, some questions that were likely asked by the investigators and hopefully they receive satisfactory answers to help clear suspects or potential suspects in this case. So one, was there an assistant manager scheduled to work on the morning of February 2nd, 2008? And if so, where was he or she and what was the reason for them not being at the store Two, did the money from the previous day get dropped at the bank on the day of the shooting? If so, did the bank have any cameras that they could see if the people making the money drop were followed to or from the bank? Yeah. Number three, could an ex employee or an assistant manager have promised a large payout from a safe and then change their mind and failed to show up to assist this offender. Yeah. Next question I would have would be, have Lane Bryant employees or ex-employees uh, from other locations been investigated? Thought here, too, a little bit going deeper into this, going back a little bit, the Lane Bryant store was open. This particular store was open prior to Rhoda McFarland having taken over as a manager. So who was the prior manager? And was the combination to the safe changed when management changed? Yeah, sometimes those safes just change randomly. Yeah, and who and who's in charge of save changing the safe combination? Is that something that they send somebody in from corporate to do that, or is that just going making a phone call and stating, "Well, now you have to change the combination. Mm -hmm. Here's the old one." Um, you know, is that left up to that particular store? What's the protocol on that? And then here's another question that I would have regarding the safe combination. Mm -hmm. Are the safe combinations different per location or are they similar enough to figure out a different store's combination? Now, that seems like a weird question, right? No, most of these. But it doesn't, does it? When people who have worked retail or worked where there are safes, especially in franchises or chains, mm -hmm. they understand that that question is not that strange of a, of a thought, right? I think it's strange. The reason why is because most of those people hire security companies to help them do this stuff. So the security companies are not going to have branches in similar locations to have combinations that are even remotely close. That's my guess. I mean, and that's just from my experience with banking and how many times we had to change combinations to everything, to the main vault, to mm -hmm. the teller vault, to individual vaults on our teller stations and in the back room. And so I'm guessing that Lane Bryant being such a big store, what do you say? 800 and some stores. Yeah. 800 some and stores as of yeah, 2013, they're going to have some security company that's kind of monitoring all that stuff. They're going to pay somebody to, to monitor that. I agree. I could be wrong. I agree, but let me throw this at you. And, and I know you're speaking on experience, but you're speaking from your experience having worked in a bank. Now I know uh -huh. you worked retail and, at some point as well. I don't know if you had any insider knowledge of how they did the, the safes what, there at the well, retail. Well, I was telling you at the, <laughs> well, I think it was just a key, but I was telling you during the break, I, I believe our safe uh, at PacSun, you could have just picked up and walked out with, like it wasn't like, a, I don't even think it was attached to a wall or anything. Right. Because, <laughs> but that's A strong person could carry it out of the store. Yeah, and this would have been 2001 when I worked there. So we're talking about a long time ago. There was, there was barely any cash ever in that store. 
If somebody when it came in to rob us, it's like, here's your couple hundred bucks. Have a nice day. I worked retail very briefly and I was such a low level employee. I had no knowledge of anything. I, I went in there and worked for fun twice a week, basically. Um, <laughs> I worked for fun. Well, I mean, they paid me, but it was just right. kind of a, a fun job that I took. But however, I did work as a uh, manager at a gas station and a manager at a pizza shop. Mm. Now we had pretty at both places. We had pretty loosey goosey rules as far as how we conducted business. I will say this at, at the, yeah, but this was what? 1976. No, 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 no. It would have been like 99, wow. 2000. So, I will say this, the one, the gas station that I worked for is a major chain. I'm not going to say what, na- what the brand is because I don't want people to know this. Well, uh, we don't want people <laughs> looking down on that brand for hiring you at the location that I worked. We had a four digit combination to the safe. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I pose this question of could an employee of another store have some general knowledge of how this store works. And I don't think that's far fetched even as much so as a possible combination idea for the safe. And I bring this up because of my experience there. So our, we had a store number, a four digit store number, which is not easily known to the general public. It had nothing to do with our street address. Right. It wasn't posted anywhere on the outside of the store, on the inside of the store. It was something that usually only the managers would know. Uh, most of the employees, we're unaware of our store number. However, I will say this, and I, and I only know this, and maybe it didn't work this way at every location, but at the time that I worked at this gas station, our combination, our four digit combination to our safe was the store number. <laughs> That's stupid. Well, no, it is stupid. It, it, it's, it's very stupid, but it's also not it's not crazy. It's not out of the realm of possibility that this no, type of thing was though. going on, on on other places. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, all we have to know is how much money did he get? And I'm sure that the law enforcement is well aware of where he got the money from, mm-hmm. oh, who yeah. he got the money from. So this is a question that they could obviously answer captain before we move on to i have a a bit of an outside the box theory here but before we move out of talking about robbery that turned into a got turned violent and turned into murder right there's another theory out there that's that i find to be very interesting and the theory is to simplify it is an out-of-town offender meets an out-of-town murdered witness. And what I mean by that is, remember we mentioned earlier that Jenny Bishop, she was from out of town. She was in town with her husband that was there on work. Mm -hmm. And Jenny was going shopping while her husband was out working that day. Mm -hmm. Is Is there a chance, and this is just food for thought, that the offender, that the the man that went in to rob the Lane Bryant store, could he have been staying at one of those local hotels where she was staying? And they they had seen each other prior to the robbery. He gets in, in there in the back room, and now he's got a customer that he recognizes her face. He doesn't know her name, but mm-hmm. if he recognizes her as having stayed at the same hotel as he had the night before, he would probably assume that she might be able to say, Hey, that guy that took off with the money out of here, he was staying at the blah, blah, blah hotel last night. Possibly. I, I, I do believe that the suspect was triggered by the 911 call because once that call happened, you know, five murders within minutes. Yeah. That's when the shooting starts. So I, I find this theory intriguing and, and I find it to be very interesting and it, it makes me kind of think about other possibilities here. I would believe that, that a lot of time was spent investigating those local hotels. You know, most of the time people, they keep records of mm-hmm. license plates, vehicles. Well, uh, you normally need a credit card to rent. Credit uh, card ID, yeah. all those sort of things. Not that this individual couldn't have stolen, you know, couldn't have put together materials to travel Mm -hmm. um, and use somebody else's funds or vehicle for that. One of the theories here is that this was not a robbery at all, that this was kind of 
is kind of staged to be a robbery, but in sense there was there was a murder that was actually going to happen. And the thought on this is Rhoda McFarlane. She would be at the center of this theory because for several years, Rhoda had been deeply involved with the Embassy Christian Center, which is a now defunct church in Crest Hill, Illinois. She began as an administrative assistant to the pastor George Ajay Jr. and soon became one of his most trusted colleagues. She was ordained as a minister and had become an associate pastor at the church. And she was even counseling girls. Remember we said she set up that princess program. At some point, Rhoda began to feel uncomfortable with some of Ajay's financial decisions. It's unclear of what, if any wrongdoing transpired and whether Rhoda's discomfort was solely over finances or if it included something more personal that she had uncovered. So a bad relationship happens between these two. Now, around this same time, the church's membership went from 1,000 people to 75 by the time of 2006. Mm. And this is when Rhoda decides to leave. Yes, just looking, looking on the outside in, when you see drastic numbers like that drop, you assume, you kind of assume something weird is going on there, right? Well, yeah, well, it sounds to me that he was making some weird decisions this got out to uh, his, the the members of the church. Most of the members of the church probably thought it was shady or or not a part of their belief systems, and they mm-hmm. left. Mm-hmm. Well, Ajay, he moved with his family and several church members to Austin, Texas, and this was to start a new church, um, Embassy Nation Network, which now appears to be closed as well. Well, and the only problem with this theory for me is that Rona wasn't scheduled to work that day. Yeah, no, I I get what you're saying, but I want to kind of go into this in a little more depth here because this was something that the police investigated. And even though they've been very tight lipped about it, one intriguing clue that the investigators uncovered is a 20 minute phone call placed by a former embassy member. Now this took place about an hour before the murders and it was routed through the tower the cell phone tower nearest the Lane Bryant store. Mm. Apparently this was enough to pique the task force interest because in late July of the year of the murders, nearly a dozen detectives from the major crimes task force traveled to Texas to interview former church members and associates of Rhoda, including a Jai. And now uh, apparently at this time he was living in some big mansion up in the Hills and, uh, somewhere in Texas when they tracked him down now. <laughs> right. So you go from a thousand members to 75 and then you go to Texas and you close down another church, but you're still living in a mansion. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, interesting how that works. Ajay has publicly and forcefully rejected any notion that his church is linked to the homicides and investigators have continually said that, um, currently that they have no suspects. So, but, but it's an intriguing connection, the Texas connect connection for several reasons. And one is the day before the murders, there was a San Antonio news site. This is W O a I.com ran a story about a sex scandal involving a pastor named Rick Hawkins. Hawkins is alleged to have used church funds to silence women either because he had had affairs with them or he has sexually harassed them. Now, a poster on that site using the name For What's Right left the following comment under the Hawkins story. For What's Right, February 1st, 2008, posted, Well, someone should check out George Ajay in Austin, Texas, formerly of Illinois. He has ties with Hawkins and has been suspected of doing the same thing. The name of his church is Embassy Nation Church, formerly Embassy Christian Center. Records show For What's Right registered on that day and posted on that day and never commented again. There are some out there that believe that this For What's Right could actually have been 
Rhoda McFarland. Mm. So I he, here's the thing, Captain. That's an interesting theory. It's an interesting thought. Very one, interesting. One that we shouldn't completely rule out here that that maybe somebody was sent to kill Rhoda or one of these other people. Now, regarding this particular theory, there is the cell phone tower information, but really nothing much else. Right. Um, so while it sounds like a very juicy lead and possible theory, keep in mind the police did investigate this. And currently, today, they're stating that while through the course of 10 years, they have had what they thought to be many good suspects, As we sit here today, they are telling us they have no suspects. So having investigated this, telling us they have no suspects, it seems like it's been thoroughly investigated and possibly no connection. Mm -hmm. But I do want to mention this before we conclude today. Another possible Texas connection is that America's Most Wanted, uh, the great TV show, they covered this case when it was fresh. Well, after doing a segment on the Lane Bryant case, case they concluded that the killer sounded like he had some type of southern accent if you'd like to help shine some light on this case get people talking make sure you share our post on social media see you tomorrow back here in the garage until then be good be kind and don't litter It's not just a vintage car. It's the car you and your mom took to the beach every summer break. It's not just a wine cellar. It's years of memory stocked vineyard by vineyard. And that case full of autographed baseballs? A passion 30 years in the making. Cincinnati Insurance designed Cincinnati Private Client for the collections that tell a story. Because it's not only about insuring what you care for, it's about protecting what inspires you. The Cincinnati Insurance Companies. Everything insurance should be.